yeah, I'm excited about this opportunity. I'm excited about this passage. We all love this passage, and uh, I know that you're excited about it too. Uh, <laughs> it is one of those passages, just to be honest with you, that comes with a great deal of resistance, struggle, and misunderstanding. It is a passage that has often been used to defend or even legitimize bad behavior. This is a passage that many Christians would be happy if it just wasn't in the Bible at all. It makes many Christians cringe. Others get defiant. There's a group that applauds. And to be quite honest with you, it is extremely important for us all. This passage is something that all of us need to grab hold of and understand and apply in our lives. Now let me read to you the passage found in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 21 through the end of the chapter. I'm going to read it all to you. Here it goes. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did, did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of, this, of his body. As the scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now we hear these words, to be quite honest, you... We don't even have to get very far into the passage still, until some of us start bristling up. We're like, submit the head of love by giving up your life. What, what are we talking about here? We immediately get on the defensive when we hear these. So how is a preacher going to explain the truth of this passage? What, what, am, what am I to do? I thought to myself, well, the best thing I can do is to go to the experts. So that's what I did. I went to the experts. And here's what the experts said. Christian, Kirsten, excuse me, not Christian, Kirsten, age 10. No person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it all way before, and you get to find out later who you're stuck with. <laughs> Kirsten's got it down. Alan, age 10. You've got to find somebody who likes the same stuff. Like if you like sports, she should like sports. And she should keep the chips and dip coming. <laughs> Expert. Expert. Freddie, age 6. He was asked to give the right age to get married. This is how he replied. No age is good to get married at. You've got to be a fool to get married. Now, Freddie's six years old. Where did he hear that? You know, I do. I don't know. Anita, age nine. In answering the age-old question about whether it's better to be single or married, she said this, it is better for girls to be single, but not for boys. Boys need someone to clean up after them. And then the last one, the, the real expert, Ricky, age 10, when asked how best to make a marriage work, Ricky gives this great advice. Tell your wife she looks pretty even if she looks like a truck. So, oh, Ricky. Ricky knows his stuff. <laughs> Truth is, these kids have said some pretty humorous things, but in their, in their comments, there is a reflection of our society. In their comments, we see to some degree, really how our society uh, looks at marriage, how they, how they view marriage. I, I heard a story from, uh, that 
Eric Snyder put out there. He's a minister at a church of Christ. And he said this. He said, I, I recently did a wedding, and during the wedding rehearsal, the groom pulled me aside and made me an offer. He said, look, I'll give you $100 if you'll change the wedding vows. When you get to me in the part where I'm to promise, love, honor, and obey, I'd appreciate it if you just leave that part out. And he handed him $100, and he walked away. So the day of the marriage came. Bride and groom were there in front of Eric. He's going through the ceremony. They're exchanging vows. And when it came time for the groom's vows, he said, I looked at the young man and I said, will you promise to bow down before her, obey her every command and wish, serve her breakfast in bed every morning of your life, and swear eternally before God and your lovely wife that you will not ever even look at another woman as long as you both shall live. He said the groom looked at him, gulped, and said in a tiny voice, yes. <laughs> then the groom leaned in and he asked, what happened? I thought we had a deal. He said, so I gave him back his $100 and told me, well, she made a better one. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, truth is, that's how our world, that is exactly how our world looks at marriage. That's how they look at the marriage re relationship. It is a contract in their minds where I am trying to get the very best for me. That's it. I'm going in. I'm trying to bargain for the best for me. I want it to meet my needs. I want everything to fall into place for me. I want someone who's going to take care of me. And the truth is, if you look at marriage that way, it is never going to be the way God wants it to be. You're always going to be lacking and by the way, you're probably not going to stay married very long. So how are we supposed to view marriage? What does God want when his word talks about submission and headship? What is he asking for? Aren't those words that, that are devaluing a woman? Is, is that what he's saying? Well, it doesn't appear to be what he's saying at all because in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 28, it says, for all, for, excuse me, for, for you all are children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. Now listen to what he says. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ. I just want you to understand, God has declared in his word that we should not value someone more than another based on really anything. We're all valuable to him. He declares that there is no group that is more valuable or more important or more worthy than another group. He declares that we should love all. In fact, he loves us all. So what are we supposed to do with this call to submission? What are we supposed to do with this reference to, to headship in this text? I mean, that's really where the problem, that's where everyone gets bristled at. If we can figure out those two things, we could probably figure out this passage. So what are we supposed to do with those things? Well, the truth is, what we're supposed to do with those things is obey them, but let me, let me, let me help you out here. You do have to look at the context of what's being said here. And the best way to look at biblical context is to kind of look at the Bible. And so let's just back up. Same exact chapter, right at the beginning of it. Chapter 5, Ephesians 5. This is what we start off with. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. So he's talking to Christians, talking to all you and me, all of us. He says, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. I think it's important that we, that we back up a minute and we look at how we start this chapter off. We start this chapter off with this idea that you and I are supposed to be imitating God. And we imitate God according to these first two verses by living a life of love. In fact, it continues and says, do it like Jesus did. Follow in the footsteps of Jesus who was willing to give himself up for others. The chapter starts there. I, I want you to understand, this is a letter that they're reading, and there were no chapters or verses when they were reading it. 
Uh, so this is a thought that continues on. So we kind of have to back up and look at that. Now let me ask you a question. Who of us is supposed to love like Jesus and the Father loves? All of us. Does all of us include wives? Yes, it does. Does all of us include husbands? Yes, it does. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Back to the very first verse I read to you, chapter 5, verse 21. Again, just a few verses later, same chapter. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Who is supposed to submit to one another? All of us. Oh, you didn't say that as quick. You said it quick with the love part. You kind of held back here on this one. All of us. Does that include husbands? Yeah. Are you a part of the all of us? Yes, you are. Does that include wives? Does that include children? Yes, and maybe we need to make sure they understand that. That's a side note. <laughs> we might catch that later. I just threw that. That's just bonus material. You can put that in the book right there, bonus. So as we look at this passage, let's first start by defining these words and, and what they're really calling us to do. Because these are action words for our marriages. And these action words are love and submit. Here they are, love and submit. Now, love, the problem we have with love is that we misunderstand love in our culture. In our culture, we define love as a warm, fuzzy feeling. I have this warm, fuzzy feeling. I saw her and I was, oh, I just, I was flustered. And, you know, I just, you know, I couldn't speak well and blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. But that's not biblical love. That's not at all what biblical love talks about. Biblical love is an act of commitment where you and I put the best interest of another person before ourselves. That's love. I put you above me. That's love. I make sure that you have what you need above what I need. That is love. I heard about a preacher who was uh, trying to counsel a man who was having marital trouble. So he said to the man, the Bible says, husbands, love your wives. The man responded, but, but I do not love her anymore. The preacher went on, well, well then, love her as a sister in the Lord. The man responded, but, but I don't think she's saved. The preacher thought about it and he responded, well, well, then love her as your neighbor. The man responded, well, I don't have any intention of being her neighbor. Oh. Finally, the preacher thought about it for a second. He said, well, then do what God says, and love her as your enemy. One way or the other, you're going to need to love her. You're going to have to love her. Love her even if you have to love her as an, as an enemy. We have got to realize that the love you and I have been called to is a love that is called agape love, which is called the Christian love, which is a love that is unconditional. In fact, it is displayed by Jesus himself. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. That is the love we're talking about here. And as husbands, we've been called to love like that. We've been called to put that love on display in our relationships where we lay down our lives. You might say, well, I, I, I take a bullet for my wife. I would too. But would you do the dishes for your wife? Because that's laying your life down too. That's laying down your life. That's laying down your life. That's important as well. Now, let's get to the harder word. And that word is submit. Now, in our language, once again, submit has a very, very, very negative idea. In our culture, when you hear the word submit, you automatically think a lessening of value, a loss of identity, a loss of dignity. You even might think enslavement in some capacity. But the truth is, once again, biblically, it meant something completely different. In fact, to submit biblically means to prioritize the interest and well-beings of another person above your own. You put yourself underneath someone in order to put their interest and well-being above yourself. By the way, it's 
very much described in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, here's a, here's a great description of what we're being told here. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Think of others better than yourself. Don't look, excuse me, don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Jesus or Christ Jesus had. Listen, when we actually understand what is actually being said here, what looks from our vantage point as ominous at best is actually a beautiful picture of the kind of relationships we should all be involved in, in our marriages and otherwise for that matter. But there's still one last phrase, and that one really hangs people up, and that phrase is that he is head of his wife. What does that mean? To be quite honest, it's the easiest of all the phrases to understand in this text. What? This phrase is the easiest one to understand in our text. Well, why is it the easiest? Well, it's the easiest because he tells us how to understand it. Paul tells us how to understand it. He says, you are supposed to be a head over your wife as Christ is a head over the church. Okay, I'm liking this. Woo! But then he goes on and he explains what that means. And he explains what that means in verse 25. Verse 25, here it says, For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church and he gave up his life for her. Headship. Giving up your life for someone else. That, that's what's being described here. We make it so hard. But what is being described here is to love your wife like Christ loved the church and died for it. And we should die for her. Sacrifice yourself for your wife like Jesus sacrificed himself for the church. To be the head is to love like Christ. And to love like Christ is to put the needs of your wife above your own. To live under the headship is to submit like the church submits to Christ. And to do that, that means putting the interest of your husband above your own. Now, I don't know if you figured it out yet, but these sound very similar, do they not? Because they are. This is a single point sermon, and here is the point. Marriage is supposed to be a visible reenactment of the gospel. That's what it's supposed to be. You and me, we're supposed to be reenacting the, the gospel. We're supposed to be reenacting and showing the world what grace looks like. I lower myself and put my wife's needs and wants above my own. She responds by prioritizing and lowering herself and putting my needs and my wants above her own. In fact, we're both in a race to see who can serve the other one more. And that's marriage. That's what we're being called to do. If you're using your marriage relationship in any other way than that, you are misrepresenting God you are misrepresenting the gospel, and you are misrepresenting our relationship as a church to Jesus. We're supposed to be showing the world grace, and our marriage relationship should be right there at the forefront. Now, by the way, if you're not married, every relationship should be right there at the forefront. I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to share this story again. It's a story about Liz Curtis Higgs. Liz Curtis Higgs was one of the best known disc jockeys in America. And before she came to the Lord, she lived a very wild life. Howard Stern was the AM show disc jockey. Liz Curtis Higgs was the PM show disc jockey. Now, if any of you know Howard Stern, Howard Stone Stern one day said to Liz Curtis Higgs, you know, you need to clean up your act. Howard Stern said, clean up your act. 
Miss Curtis Higgs had been burned by many men and her heart was broken. So she became a militant feminist. Militant feminist. But she had a Christian girlfriend who kept on inviting her to church and kept on inviting her to church and kept on inviting her to church. And so one day, after all these invitations, over and over and over again, she finally said she would come, but she was only going to come once, and it was only going to be that one time. She'll come one time, one time only. So she went to church with a friend. The preacher got up to preach, and guess what passage he preached on? This passage. So there she sits, and the very first things out of his mouth are him reading the Bible verses that say, Wives, submit to yourself as uh, submit yourselves to your husbands. This is not really the best verse, probably, to start off a relationship with a militant feminist. But she sat there and she cringed and she got a little bit uptight. She got a little bit ticked off. She started to feel anger boiling up inside her, but she continued to listen to him. And he continued to preach, and he continued on with these verses, and he said, you see, the second part says, and husbands love, uh, excuse me, and husbands, you sacrifice yourselves, you give yourselves for your wives, just as Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for the church and died for her. She listened. She asked herself, well, who's supposed to give up her life? The husband? The husband's supposed to give up her life? So she leaned over to her Christian friend, and she said, you know, with a little bit of cynicism, she said, well, you know, I'd gladly give myself to any man who would die for me. Her friend leaned back over and whispered in her ear, Liz, there is a man who loved you enough to die for you. His name is Jesus. That's how much he loved you. Not long after that, by the way, Liz Curtis Hicks dropped her guard and she surrendered her life to God. And she be became a believer and, to be quite honest, a well-known Christian author and, and speaker. But it all happened in the context of these verses. But the truth is, when you recognize what these verses really say, they should transform marriages and relationships and hearts. When we love like we've been called to love, and when we submit like we've been called to submit in our marriages, then we are proclaiming to the world the love of Christ, a love that changes everything, that transforms lives, that transforms attitudes, that transforms relationships. And back to verse 32, this is what it says about this text. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. It's so easy for us to look at these verses and immediately close our hearts. It's easy for us to look at these verses and immediately start thinking of ways that we can take advantage of our spouse. But the truth is, that's not what these verses are about. These verses are supposed to be defining how we can love and submit to one another in such a way that the world will see the very grace of God in our lives. That's what these verses are about. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for the text here that we find in Ephesians 5. And to be quite honest, it is one of those texts that most of the time we're not really excited to look at. And yet, in it, there are so many great and exciting things. And I pray, Lord, that those things would transform our relationships, our marriage relationships, and every other relationship. When we love like Christ and put the needs of someone else above our own. When we submit and put the needs of someone else above our own. Well, whatever's getting in the way of us having the very best relationships we possibly can have, Lord, I help that you would, I, I pray that you would help us to remove those things, whatever they are. Lead us to the cross. Lead us in the very footsteps of Jesus. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.